Anyone who followed my channel from before, you guys know that I love chatbots and I love conversational AI and everything you can do with it, the powers behind it and even how businesses already start making a lot of money with it. And in today's video, I want to take it from a bit of a different angle where I'm going to explain you a little bit more about the actual security risks and dangers that these kind of conversational AI tools bring along that we can barely control or in a very minimal way, even though there are solutions. And I just believe it's super, super important for you guys to understand what is going on behind the scenes and how you can kind of counteract that to make sure that you're not running into kind of security issues or maybe data loss or phishing and quite a couple of other things. So today we are going to cover three main aspects that I believe are major security issues with the things that we are dealing with within my agency. And I will also provide you a couple of solutions that we use to minimize those risks, to minimize the danger that they are causing, because all of those things are not necessarily being influenced by you. So you cannot directly do something against some of them, but for some you can, and I'm going to show you how you can do that in the first place. So with that out of the way, let's dive into the first one, which I think is one of the most interesting ones and the ones that you actually can reproduce yourself so that you can kind of do testing with it. And that is data phishing and scamming and what that basically means is that people can create certain content on websites that can include types of prompts or just parts of a specific prompt that might be interpreted by AI or by your conversational tool whatever you use and then give you an output that is not expected so if you have seen my previous video about negative prompting it's probably linked somewhere here it's kind of an issue where you basically mention something in the prompt that you don't want to have inside of the context but just for the fact of you mentioning it, it is more likely that it actually occurs. And something like that is also true, unfortunately, for other aspects when you fetch information from within the web. So let's, for example, take OpenAI and their GPTs or the OpenAI Assistant API. Both of those tools have the possibility or an action called retrieval, which basically allows you to fetch website content from any kind of website and format it into whatever you want and basically do a prompt after that, that formats the things or, or extracts the information that you specifically want from the website. So <laughs> I explained it pretty complex, but you definitely get the hang of it. So you basically just take content from the website and validate that using AI. And while this is usually a very good thing, the issue comes in if there are malicious websites that kind of try to put a certain part of a prompt inside of the content. And I tried a lot with that. I can even show you the content. I can give you access to the templates in case you wish and you would like to see that. Just drop me a link down below in the comments and I'll make a specific video about that as well. But the, the main point is that you can basically kind of inject certain parts of a prompt in website content. So whenever you are fetching content from that website, for you as a user, it's probably not visible, but whenever a bot scrolls it, it can see that content and it then can include stuff that you don't want, right? So you can basically get a backlink redirected to a different website that contains other information that your chatbot was providing from before. So there are tons of ways that you can adjust those things. And if you look at it from a, a different angle, it basically means that whatever your chatbot has access to, from that history from the past, it can be kind of repurposed inside of that part of the prompt that you just kind of crawled from the website and can then be again used or kind of sent to a different service, which can cause kind of like different trouble. So this is one of them. The other one is that you can also kind of include parts of an extra action inside of that prompt that you add to a website. So if you use a tool like OpenAI's Assistant API, it might be that the Assistant API actually reads that prompt and interprets it and kind of sends information to a different action that you probably don't even want and that's not intended. So you can kind of manipulate the way your actual conversation works by including parts of a prompt into a website that is then scrolled using the retrieval AI. So while that thing sounds pretty complex, it's actually not at all. I literally created this or recreated that issue in less than 10 minutes so if you're interested really I'm gonna make a video about that I'm gonna show it to you and I explain you exactly how it works and how you can kind of counteract that with uh, some more specific examples so for now that is all I want you to keep in mind which is the first thing so it's basically data phishing and scamming so basically people can inject certain parts of a prompt into your content or into your conversation through external services or external tools that you integrate with and that can cause security issues or outputs that you don't expect or that can be falsified or whatever so this is something you need to look out for because it definitely messes up the quality of your chatbot. The second issue we are going to look in is called jailbreaking and jailbreaking to be more specific, jailbreaking chatbots or conversational AI, which again means that you kind of just use prompts to 
break out of the actual scope of the chatbot. So let's say you have a real estate agency and you have created a chatbot that is super amazing and it allows users to schedule viewings, to find listings, to create leads, basically all stuff we did in our previous chatbot. And then you have some tricksters that are really good with prompting and they try to rephrase things inside of prompts in a way that make the chatbot do different things because that is actually something that's possible by smart prompting. So you can just kind of get it out of the scope that you defined and make it do other things, which first of all is not nice to do. And secondly, it can also go to your token usage because people can just abuse the bot for their own purposes and use your tokens for that so that is something to keep in mind and it's also a problem that we face even with our clients because when they continue to develop their bot by themselves without our supervision what often happens is that they don't know how to limit those prompts in a certain way to avoid doing that so this is a very very common thing and i'm very happy to show you a solution for that at the end of this video as well so that you can kind of counteract that yourself in the best way possible though it is not completely avoidable as you know prompts are so flexible and they are just prompts so any output can be generated in the first place which is something that we have to take as a burden for the advantage of the flexibility and the third point i would like to talk about is called data poisoning and it is something that we as the users of LLMs don't really have much influence to. So this is kind of data manipulation on a larger scale. So if you're using OpenAI, good for you, amazing, you use OpenAI, there's nothing you could do against that. You would just need to live with the fact that some of that information might be false or falsified and that might even be done on purpose. And it is something that can be done with a few resources and some really good programming knowledge. Cause what you basically want to do is you, what those attackers do is they want to scale websites that are listed maybe already with domain authority for Google or other search engines so that they have kind of the authority of actually sharing information about something specific. And when they can do that, their content is basically valued more by search engines and also obviously by LLMs that are trained on public data, which is the same thing with OpenAI. So OpenAI basically is trained on public data that is available in the web. So let's say there's an attacker, he launches a thousand websites with very similar content to one topic, but all of that is falsified so that it serves the need of the attacker or kind of brings that information more to the advantage of the attacker. He can create content specifically on that, for example, also for political topics, manipulate that and then allow the LLM to crawl through all of the public domain and fetch that information and take it as the real one, right? Because the LLM doesn't diversify of what information actually is true or wrong. It is just that information that we are basically sharing online that the LLM or OpenAI is trained on. So that can again cause the issue that this information is fed to AI or to the LLM and trained on it so that we get that output and expect it to be correct, even though the LLM considers that it's correct as well because it was trained on it, but the actually att attacker knew all of that and kind of falsified that information so that it's not good for us, but it's beneficial for them. So this is a task that is super, super hard to control for I think any kind of LLM because like I mentioned, if you train an, an AI, it takes tons of data and validating all of that is very, very hard. So you basically need to first have an AI that kind of can validate data in a certain way. If it cannot validate it, dispose it and then just use that information that actually can be validated but again then it is more limiting to the powers of the LLM and probably the output you're going to get so just keep that in mind whenever you work with an LLM it might not all be correct so giving it a scope is great and is definitely recommended and especially doing it in a way so that you can only work with information that you certainly know will be true in a, in a way and it also again comes down to just testing the chatbot trying to figure out some pitfalls or some some holes where you think the chatbot might drift away to some different topic and then kind of counteract on that. All right, with that out of the way, we are coming to potential solutions or how we are basically tackling that issues inside of my agency. And I'm going to share all of them with you of the ones that we know and that actually work for us so that you can probably kind of implement them into your business and use them to make your chatbots greater. And let's get started with the first one, which is input sanitation and output sanitation, which basically is nothing else than actually taking the information that comes back from an endpoint or maybe even from the AI and wrapping it in a format where it's mostly clear for the AI what parts belong to what so that it cannot be really injected with some other kind of prompts or partial prompts so that we can avoid that issue in the first place. So let's, for example, take the first data scamming example that I gave you. Let's say there's a website that has parts of a prompt included into the content and we want to avoid our AI to kind of work on that, right? So what we can do is we kind of use markdown language, for example, to pre-format that content in a certain way. And there's also something called backticks. And if you use a triple backtick inside of markdown, it is interpreted as a code example 
example. So let's say we have three backticks. We put in the content that we got back from the website crawler and we ended with three backticks. It is basically considered one block of code and the chances of AI actually interpreting whatever is inside of the block as a prompt is more limited than it would be otherwise. Of course, there might still be the possibility that it happens, but for us, the goal is to reduce the risks as much as possible so that we can focus on the quality of the output and we don't need to deal with more issues than we should in the first place. So that is it for data scamming. The second issue we use, we are using in more sophisticated approaches where we want to value the quality and the security more than anywhere else. And that is usually happening if it comes to actions that involve some sensitive information. And for that, we are often using classifiers, which basically is another prompt or another request to AI, where we are checking if that request is legit, how common it is to ask something like that in the context that we are already giving it from the history of the conversation. So we can basically get kind of a prediction if that information actually is valuable to the conversation or if there's just a trickster trying to prompt things around. Because based on that, we get back a score that is not as good as it should be for a normal conversation. And we can just kind of stop the conversation or just redirect it to either a human so that the user basically just works with a human instead of the bot itself. So that again just helps us to avoid those pitfalls in the first place. Though I have to mention it is a more expensive approach as you have to make for every message you send you basically have to make a secondary request that talks with AI and basically validates that information and sends it back so you need to use a lot more tokens and it just becomes more expensive. So this is something you have to look into if it's worth it. Definitely implement it if you have some sensitive information. It will definitely help to just validate the outputs more and provide a more secure and more smooth experience to your users as well. The third solution we are using to make our chatbots more secure is by sanitizing our actions. So if you have worked with OpenAI's GPTs or with the Assistant API, you know that you can create custom tools or actions that can interact with real world services so that you can kind of give your bot access to more features, more power, it can do actually things for you. And this is really amazing. But what we do is we actually focus more towards sanitizing these input fields. So let's, for example, say we build a schedule viewing action where you collect things like the first name, the email addresses, the date and time of the visit, the property ID. All of those details basically should follow a certain format. So it makes total sense to just use sanitization tools either within code or even within no code solutions like make.com or zapier they also have sanitization tools where you can basically just take a certain content and validate it for your needs using regular expressions which is a bit more complex but also other tools that simply do things like search and replace or minify characters or set them all lowercase or just validate them for emails you will see in mostly any no code tools solutions for that as well and it's super important to implement them so let's say you expect an email you always want to make sure that the content is sanitized for being an email so that there's no other malicious code that can go through in case some trickster tries to prompt things around. So this is something to keep in mind and you can do this with anything. You can do this with strings, you can do this with integers, which is full numbers. You can do this with floats and booleans. So any kind of values that you put in somewhere, you should always sanitize them to whatever their expected output is so that you just make sure there's no other content than the one you actually would like to have inside of it. So this is a major aspect and that is always something we definitely do in all of our chatbots that we're working with as it's just something to improve the overall quality of the experience and the values and as well as the accuracy of our chatbot. The third solution I would like to talk about is called Rasa and that is a conversational AI that allows us to build chatbots in a more limited or more scoped way. So it is not as flexible as OpenAI's GPT for example or Assistant API where you can ask mostly anything and it will give you an answer back. Rasa basically works on something called stories where it's like a flow of information that you go through step by step and ask the user these questions whenever he has a certain input. So we still use natural language inside of the bot to actually ask things, but the bot only reacts on stories that we kind of predefined. So let's say the user asks something like, I'd like to schedule a viewing for a property. Then we have a story that says, okay, he wants to schedule a viewing, then ask for the first name, ask for the date time, ask for the property ID, email, whatever it is. And then the bot runs through that scenario, asking all of those questions, but it's more on a static side. So it has to follow that flow in a certain way to the end for us to actually expect a proper output. And while that is limiting on the other way, it is great for security as whenever someone tries to <laughs> write some weird prompt into your chatbot, the chatbot probably doesn't know it because it doesn't follow any story so it's just neglecting it and trying to start asking basic things like sorry I didn't understand the request please try to rephrase it or something like this so it just helps us to keep the scope to only provide features that are 
intended from our side. And it makes it also much easier to validate information and provide the things better for human handovers. So this whole approach is basically just using a natural language understanding tool that makes it super powerful for us to still interact in a more natural language way while not neglecting on the security aspects. So this is specifically interesting for medium-sized companies or larger sized companies or enterprises. So it's more on the technical side, so you definitely need to have someone that with coding knowledge and maybe as well with a little bit of AI knowledge so to get a better understanding on how to set those things up. And Rasa is a more advanced tool, so you should definitely also think about continuous deployment, which basically means how you develop those bots, how you implement them on the server, how you continue upgrading them and adding new features to it. Because it's, a, it's like I mentioned, a more sophisticated platform as well. It's open source, it's free, so you can check it out. I will also add the links for that down below in the description so you can see it for yourself and maybe try it if it's fit for your business. But just keep in mind, it's more technical and it's something that as a beginner, it's very, very hard to grasp and actually set it up. And that already brings me to the end of this video. And I hope you really enjoyed those kind of security issues that I mentioned, as well as the solutions that we are implementing inside of our business for our chatbots and for the chatbots of our clients. And there are way more to that. And I would like to cover more of that in future videos. For now, it's probably already a lot for you to, to wrap your head around, but definitely make sure to keep them in mind. They can drastically impact your business and your conversational chatbot as well. So don't neglect them. Try to do your research on them try to find pit holes where you can run into issues and then fix them from there. Thanks a lot for watching. If you have any more questions, feel free to drop me a comment down below and I'm very happy to see you next time.